Assalamu ala Rasulillah wa ala alihi wa sahbihi wa man wa alaha. All praise due to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, the Lord of the heavens and the earth, the maker and the creator of this universe, and peace and blessings upon our Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. So today is another lesson from the Sira classes, brothers and sisters, um, those who are watching with us. So we've spoken previously, as we just um, done now in the, on the session, on the recap session just now, We've spoken about the importance of learning about the life of Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi the importance of learning about Sirah. Why should we learn about the life of Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi As we said, because everything that we do, we need to know why we're doing it. We don't want to be doing something as a habit, as part of our culture or the traditions of, and customs. No, we need to know why we do, why we worship Allah. Why? Why do we have to worship Allah? Why do we have to follow the messenger? Why do we have to do Salah? Why do we have to read Quran? Everything that we do in our lives, whether it's to do with religion or not something that is, has nothing to do with religion, you need to know why you're doing it. You're coming to university. Why am I studying? Okay, I want to become an engineer. That's why I'm doing engineering. I want to become a doctor. That's why I'm doing this. I want to become a teacher. That's why I'm doing this. You know, so we need to know why, we, why we're doing something. So we said it's important to learn about the life of Muhammad I said them because it exp the Sunnah of Muhammad, the Seerah of Muhammad explains the Quran to us. We cannot understand the Quran without the Sunnah of Muhammad Sallallahu and we've given examples, which examples that we've given before? Evidence, because as we said, so everything that we talk about, it has to have some evidence. So why, why can we not worship Allah based on the Quran only? Why do we have to take the Sunnah as well? Yeah. Yes. 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 So yeah. So that's one evidence. That, that, that's one of the reasons why we learn about the Sunnah of Muhammad Sallam, but Sirah of Muhammad, because the Sunnah of Muhammad explains the Quran to us. As Allah said, Wa salah. Establish the salah. Establish the prayer. But how? We learn from Muhammad said, Sallu in the hadith, Sallu kamara aytumoni usalli. Do you salah as you've seen me doing my salah? Khudu anni manasikakum. In the rituals of Hajj, he said, Take the rituals of Hajj from me, meaning, watch me how I do my Hajj and take the rituals of Hajj from me. So, Sunnah explains the Quran. Number two, we cannot understand Islam without Muhammad. We cannot understand who is Allah without Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi So Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi the Sunnah of Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam will introduce you to knowing who is Allah. Who is Allah that I'm worshipping? Like we said, we do, not, we do not want to be Muslims just because our forefathers, our parents were Muslims, that's why we're Muslims. No, we want to be Muslims by choice. We want to be Muslims because we love and enjoy being Muslims. It's not because my parents were Muslims, I'm a Muslim. No, I want to be a Muslim by choice. I chosen to be a Muslim because I appreciate what, what, what Islam. I appreciate being a Muslim. I understand the importance of this religion. I believe strongly that this is a true religion. And I enjoy being a Muslim. I love being a Muslim. I love being a worshipper of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. That's what we want to do. It's not just we do it for the sake of doing it. No, but we love it and enjoy it. That's very important. And that's what the Sahaba were doing. They enjoyed and they loved being Muslims. And then we said about the, import, the relationship between the message of Muhammad وسلم, and the message of the previous messengers in which we said what? What's the relationship? Was the what was the same? Yes. Yeah, so the... MashaAllah, yeah. So the belief was the same, which is worship Allah alone and not to associate partners with Allah. But the Sharia, the law was different from one community to another, from one messenger to another. But the belief was the same from the beginning of creation. It was the same. And then we spoke about Arabia before the time of Muhammad Sallallahu We spoke about the practices of Jahiliyyah before the time of Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi We've spoken about the other civilizations that were there. They were more advanced than the Arabs at that time. And why Allah Subh'anaHu Wa Taala has chosen Arabia specifically but knows not those other civilizations that were more educated, more advanced than the Arabs. So what were some of the practices of Jahiliyyah? The, the people never had any rights. For example, if a woman was rich and she got married <coughs> to a man, everything goes to the man. Like as you said, if you were more by the 
Yeah, so women were looked at as properties in the Jahiliya time. You know, like we said, so the same the same way a man at that time, you know, used to own a goat, a camel, you know, he owns a woman. Same thing, no difference. But Islam came to stop these practices, to eradicate all these practices. What other Jahiliya practices were there at that time? Idol yeah, idol worshipping was one of the practices of Jahiliya. What was the name of the guy? Do you remember? The name of the guy who brought idol worship in, uh, into Mecca. Where did he bring it from? Which, which country? Which area? Which region? He was on a business trip in and then he brought it. Yes. To? Yes. Okay. So, but we call it Asham. What, what, what countries make up Asham? Okay. Palestine. Yeah. Lebanon. Yeah. So Jordan, Syria, Palestine, Lebanon, this is the great Hashem, you know, the Sham. But obviously, a lot of people refer to it as Syria, but obviously, um, you know, it's a Sham. There are different countries there. But he went to Syria on a business trip, and he found them practicing idol worshipping, and he was amazed by that. And he, because they worshipped one for rain, one for money, one for family. So if you want family, you worship one of them. You, you pray to one of them. If you want rain, you pray to one of them. If you want wealth, you pray to one of them. So, and he was amazed by that. So he brought one with him to, um, to Mecca. And that's how idol worshipping started in Mecca. Yes, yes. Some of them, they were made out of stones. Okay. Some of them, as we will discover just today, we will discover today how they used to make it. Okay. But some of them, because that was a business. For them, that was a business. They used to make it and sell it. So that was a that was a, a big business at that time. Can you imagine? But just imagine, yeah. Logically speaking, you wouldn't you wouldn't understand it. How can you you make your own god, or you buy it? You buy it. Can you imagine? You buy it and then you worship it, and then you ask them to give you rain, wealth, sustenance. It's just you know. But we will see why the reason why. For me and you today, it doesn't make sense. But for them, it did make sense, and we will see what's the difference. I know. The Hindus, the Chinese, Certain people, yeah. Maybe as you said, because forefathers and calling it forefathers. Yeah, exactly. So because the, the, the main thing that we need to understand is that, as we mentioned before, that the, the Quraysh at that time, it's not that they did not believe in Allah. They did. But they used to associate partners with Allah. They used to commit shirk. That was the problem that was happening. They believed in the, in the existence of Allah. They did believe that Allah exists. But when they were asked, as they used to say to the Messenger, peace be upon him, illa We only worship them to get us closer to Allah. Meaning they are mediators between us and Allah. That was the problem, okay? So, and we spoke about that, and then obviously we spoke about some of the practices of Jahiliya, and then we spoke about the, the year of the elephants, Amul Fil and Abraha, and how we wanted to destroy the Kaaba, and he built a cathedral in Yemen, he made it nice, attractive with gold and silver, because he wanted to make money and he wanted to divert the attention of people from Mecca to there, but he forgot that people had they had a spiritual connection. They had a spiritual connection with, with the Kaaba. And then we spoke about the childhood of Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam and how he, and how he went um, to spend his early childhood in the tribe of... Which tribe? No? What was the name of the lady? The foster mother of Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. Halima what? Yes, mashallah, brother. Ahsan, mashallah, yes. Halima Sa'diya. So the tribe of Banu Sa'd. All right? So she's from the tribe of Banu Sa'd. So Halima Sa'diya, when she came and she took him. So what happened to him in the tribe of Banu Sa'd? When he was a child, what happened to him? An incident that happened to him? Yeah. And Jabari Hassan came and he took his heart out and he removed some black... Yeah, the black spot, yeah. And... His sister, yeah. to his mother, and then she had to take him back. To, to his mother, Amina. Yes. So she was scared, obviously. And that's when, when she returned him to, to his mother, Amina. Um, she, Amina, then she narrated something. Why is it? Why is that something? Yeah, but then she narrated when she was what? When she was, pre when she was pregnant. Um, yes. Yeah, when she was pregnant and when she was giving birth to him, then when she, when she described it was an easy birth 
And when she was carrying him, she never felt any pain, never ever felt pain. And you know, it was an easy birth to the Messenger of Allah Alaihi Wasallam. We spoke about the death of his mother Amina and then his grandfather Abdul Muttalib took care of him. And then at the age of eight, grandfather Abdul Muttalib died. And then Abu Talib was taking care of him after. We spoke about his journey to Asham with his with Abu Talib. And we when they met the monk, and he said to him, send him back to Mecca because they will kill him. The Jews, if they see him, they will kill him. Uh, and we said, why? Because obviously all the, the, the messengers after Ibrahim alayhi salam, they were from the Bani Israel. Who is Israel? Which messenger is Israel? No? No, but which messenger, his name is Israel? One of the messengers, one of the prophets, his name is Israel. That's why Allah says, Ya Bani Israel, oh, the children of Israel. No? Is Yaqub. Yaqub alayhi salam. Okay? Ibrahim is the grandfather of Yaqub. So Ibrahim yeah, had Ismail and Ishaq. So Ishaq is the father of Yaqub. Okay? And Yaqub is the father of Yusuf alayhi salam. So Yaqub, his other name is Israel. That's why Allah in the Quran said, Ya Bani Israel. All the children of Israel. Meaning the children of Yaqub alayhi salam. Okay? So because all the messengers, they were from coming from the lineage of Yaqub of Israel alayhi salam. So none of them was from among the Arabs. Because Ismail is the only one. And we said, was he an, or did he speak Arabic before? Ismail alayhi salam? Yes? No? How did he learn Arabic then? Did Ibrahim alayhi salam speak Arabic? No. So where did, where did Ismail learn Arabic from? Yes, it's a tribe called when Ismail Ibrahim alayhi salam he left Ismail and his mom in the desert. There's a tribe that came in called the tribe of Jurhum from Yemen. The tribe of Jurhum from Yemen they came in, so they lived there. So Ismail grew up with them and he got married from them, and that's how he learns Arabic. And that's why the nickname of Ibrahim they call him Abu al Anbiya, the father of the prophets. But Ismail, they call him the father of the Arabs. Because the lineage of the Arabs comes through Ismail alayhi salam. And Muhammad alayhi salam is the only messenger from the lineage of Ismail alayhi salam. So we spoke about the childhood of Muhammad sallallahu alayhi salam. And then he's, he, he was working for Khadija radiallahu anha. And he spoke about his honesty. He was trustworthy, truthful, peace be upon him. And that's why Khadija was amazed with the character, with the manners of Muhammad sallallahu alayhi salam. And that's why she got married to Muhammad sallallahu alayhi salam. He was 25. She was 40, and then we spoke about at the age of 40, revelation came to him from Jibreel alayhi salam. We said that he, um, when he got 40, he used to, before Jibreel came to him, he used to go in seclusion in the cave on his own to reflect and ponder upon what was happening around him until one day when Jibreel alayhi salam came to him and then he said, and Jibreel came in the form of Jibreel, of a malak, of an angel, not because he came later on in the time of the messenger in the shape of a human being. But in this time, can you imagine, this is Muhammad Sallallahu can you imagine all his, all the calamities through his life, all the hardships, all the difficulties that we said from the ch early childhood of Muhammad, but Allah was preparing him for the message. Allah was preparing him for what's going to come after me, what's going to happen to you after, O oh Muhammad, is more major than what's happening to you in your early childhood, O oh Muhammad. But so that every person, every Muslim, and this is one of the biggest lessons that we should take with us and remember this all the time, especially, specifically in the time of difficulties, in the time of need, in the time of hardships. You think, because a lot of Muslims today, because the Iman is weak, it's not strong, they start complaining, why this is happening to me? Why me? This is not fair. I'm a good Muslim. I do Salah. I go to Hajj. I give Sadaqah. I give charity. Why Allah? Why me? Why this is happening to me? See? Because the Iman is weak, but in the time of need, in the time of difficulty, remember that happened to the best human being who lived on this earth, to the final messenger, Muhammad Sallam. From his early childhood, he lived all his life's calamities and hardships. Are you better than him? No one is better than him. So in the time of need, you remember this. You remember that the best of mankind, the best human being, he had to go through difficulties and hardships and calamities. So you relate to him. That's why I said we should not. Learn the seerah as a sequence of events, but we learn the seerah as a resource that you, you, you take it 
when the, in the time of need you use that resource, you go back to it. Yeah, this has happened to Muhammad. It doesn't have to be the same incident. You might think, well, how can I relate to it? Because this incident, it never happened in the time of the messenger. It never happened to him. So how can I relate myself to him? No, you relate yourself to him in terms of the lessons, in terms of the principles. So in the time of difficulties, in the time of needs, different difficulties, different needs. So what did he do? What were the solutions? How did Allah bring ease to him? So these are the resources that we take with us. So we equip ourselves with the right tools so that we need, we use them in the time of difficulty and in the time of need. So when Jibreel السلام, came to him, that wasn't an easy moment. Can you imagine the Malak, Jibreel, the best of the Malaika coming to the best of mankind? Just honestly, brothers, as I said, it's easy talking about it, listening to it, reading it from books, but just reflect and ponder. It's nice, it's important to reflect and ponder. Can you imagine the best of the malaika, the best of the angels coming to the best of human beings, Muhammad That's That's something amazing that is happening. Can you imagine? That's something amazing happening at that time. And it's not an easy thing because it's the first time that Jibreel is coming to him, peace be upon him, and saying to him, Iqra, read, O Muhammad. Three times, Iqra, he said, Man, I cannot read. I don't know how to read. I've never been taught how to read. Again, same thing. And then the third time, he said, read in the name of your Lord, the one who created. And then he squeezed him tight until he thought he was going to die. And then after that, as we said, he went to his wife. Because of that relationship between him and his wife. If he did not have a good connection with his wife, a strong relationship between him and his wife, he wouldn't, he wouldn't have gone to his wife. He could have gone to Abu Bakr. He could have gone to another person. He could have been to Abu, gone to Abu Talib. He could have gone to Ja'far, his uncle Ja'far, to Al-Abbas, to Hamza, to any of his uncles. But because he had the love. Again, the principle of love, brothers and sisters. The principle of love is important in the life of the believers, of the Muslims. So, because of the love between him and Khadija, he went to Khadija and said, it's a milun, it's a milun, cover me, cover me. So she covered him, and then she said, Wallahi la yukhzik Allah abada. Allah will never forsake you, O Muhammad. Innaka la tukri uddayf. You are good to the guests, you look after your guests. And you are good to the needy, you support the needy, O Muhammad. You keep family ties, family kinship, O Muhammad. You do goodness on earth, O Muhammad. So how can Allah forsake you, O Muhammad? No. So, the best description or the best person to describe the husband is the wife. And today, think about it. Today, brothers and sisters, let's be honest. If you ask the wife today to describe the husbands, will they talk, will they talk nice like Khadija spoke nicely about Muhammad Because the wife, you, cannot, you can pretend to people outside. You could claim to be something that you're not outside. But the person who lives with you under the same roof, 24-7, she's the one who knows you in and out properly you cannot pretend to her you cannot claim to be something that you're not because she knows you so khadija because she knew muhammad sallam, properly and she described the characteristics and the manners of muhammad sallam. and who will confirm the words of khadija after who allah in the quran you can imagine the words of khadija because she spoke words of wisdom and we said it was a divine decree that khadija will be the first one muhammad sallam. so the love between khadija and muhammad was a divine love a love coming from the heavens and muhammad sallam, was never ashamed to say that i love khadija he said Inni hubbaha. i've been given i've been granted i've been gifted the love of khadija the love the principle of love it's very important. And then, and then when she, she wrapped him up in a garment, she covered him, and then Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, after he revealed the surahs, from, the ayahs from which surah? No, so there was the, the first revelation from surah al-alaq, but then the second ayahs came from which surah? Qalam, yes, yes, surah Qalam, yes. So he said, number one, Allah, and we will speak later, inshallah, in, you know, in this year, inshallah, we could organize certain topics about the Qur'an. So when I will speak, because sometimes we say, oh, we open the book, the Qur'an, we read. We need to reflect and ponder, because honestly, you will see wonders, you see amazing things in this Qur'an, in the, you know, in the decree of Allah, in the plan of Allah. There's a reason why Allah revealed the first five surahs. The sequence of those, not the, the order of the Qur'an that you see today, we're talking about the order of revelation. Not the order of the Qur'an that we have today, no. The order of revelation, 
So when the first, the, uh, the first ayat were from Surah Al-Alaq, Iqra' bismi rabbika ladi khalaq. The, first, the second ayat that were given to him from Surah Al-Qalam. Which surah was the first surah given as a whole surah to Muhammad Sallam? Yes, mashallah, brother. Yes, surah Fatiha. So the first surah that was given to him as a whole surah was Surah Al-Fatiha. But the surahs before, they were given as ayat, only some ayat, not the whole surah. So Allah in Surah Al-Qalam, number one, because he want to assure Muhammad, give him that reassurance that there's nothing wrong with you, Muhammad. He said, Ma anta bi You are not going crazy, O Muhammad. Nothing is wrong with you. You are not possessed by the jinn of Muhammad. You are not going crazy of Muhammad. So Allah is giving him the assurance, comforting him. The same way Khadija comforted Muhammad, so Allah is comforting Muhammad. And then he said, وَإِنَّكَ لَعَلَى خُلُقٍ عَظِيمٍ These are the words of Allah in the Quran, confirming the words of Khadija. He said, and you have the best of manners, O Muhammad. Those manners, those good characteristics that Khadija was describing about you, O Muhammad, we are, we are confirming to you that you have them, O Muhammad. You have the best of manners, O Muhammad. وَإِنَّكَ لَعَلَى خُلُقٍ عَظِيمٍ So Khadija, she took him to which person? Waraq ibn Nawfal. He was a family member of Khadija, radiallahu anha. Waraq ibn Nawfal. When she took him to Waraq ibn Nawfal, he was a monk. He had he had the knowledge of the previous scriptures of Moses and Jesus, peace be upon them. And then he said he could see the signs of prophecy on Muhammad sallallahu alaihi wasallam. And then he said, I wish that I could live longer because he was an old man. He said, I wish I could live longer to see your, your own community kicking you out of your own land, O Muhammad, so I can defend you. But I'm, I'm an old man. So he was preparing Muhammad sallallahu alaihi wasallam. So Allah is preparing Muhammad through the words of Waraq ibn Nawfal. So then, as we said, so the early stages of da'wah, what was the early stage of da'wah, brothers? Yeah, so yeah, the da'wah was done privately, in secret. So they used to meet up in the house of, which house? Al-Arqam, the house of Al-Arqam, Ibn Abi Al-Arqam. So the house of Al-Arqam, that was the meeting place of the Muslims at that time. So then, how, how, how long after, when Allah ordered him, um, you know, um, to, to start giving da'wah publicly? Three years, yeah. So after three years of giving da'wah privately, Allah ordered him to give da'wah now publicly. Ya ayyuhal muddathir, qum fa'andir. All the one who is wrapped in a garment, start calling to Allah, call to your Lord. Now it's time to start calling to your Lord. Oh Muhammad, and Allah said, wa'andir ashiratak al-aqrabin. And start calling those who are closer to you, oh Muhammad. And then we said when he went to the mountain of as safa and he started calling wa so that, that's what was that was something that was practiced at that time in mecca when someone has an important announcement to make they will go to the mountain of as safa and they will start calling wa sabaha wa sabaha so people will they start coming gathering around them so when he told them but you can you know we just recap in quickly some brothers were not here before but you can imagine because this is this is the understanding that we need to have, and these are moments that we need to reflect and ponder upon, brothers and sisters. Is like when he said to them before he made his own announcement, he said, "If I tell you right now, O Quraysh, that there is an army coming from behind this mountain of Asafa to fight you to kill you, would you believe me?" They said, "Of course, we will believe you. You are the Sadiqul Amin. You are the trustworthy one. You are the truthful one. You are the honest one." And then he said. If I tell you that I am the messenger of Allah, being sent to you from Allah as a messenger to guide you, then they wouldn't believe. So just a minute ago you were saying he is a trustworthy, the honest one, the truthful one, but now he's not anymore. SubhanAllah, you can imagine these people. But the problem was the unifying worship, the unity of God, that was one of the problems. One of the challenges, one of the problems. Whether it was because of business, because they wanted money, but later on, the fighting him is not because of money, but just because we worship what we found our forefathers worshiping. That's it. And that's why we said, I said earlier, and I said last week again, we want to be Muslims by choice. We want to be Muslims because we love and enjoy being Muslims. We do not want to be Muslims today just because our fathers, our parents, our forefathers were Muslims. And that's why we follow the footsteps just because we're Muslims. We have to be Muslims. No, we want to be Muslims by choice. We want to be Muslims because we love and enjoy being Muslims. That is very important. Because those people, they were following what their forefathers were worshipping. That's it. Because his own uncle Abu Talib, who spent his lifetime defending the messenger, even though he didn't believe in him, but he was supporting the messenger. He was supporting him. He was you know, defending him, protecting him. He done so much for the messenger for Islam, Abu Talib. He died as a non-Muslim. The minute he was about to die, Muhammad is saying, Oh, Abu Talib, 
Please just announce, just say the kalima, say the shahada, so I can intercede for you on the day of judgment. At least I can go to Allah and say, before he died, he announced the shahada of Allah. But who was with him there? Abu Jahl, one of them. He said, oh, Abu Talib, oh, Abu Talib, you're going to turn away from the religion of your forefathers? The last minute you're going to back off, oh, Abu Talib, you're going to become a chicken, Abu Talib, the last minute before you die. Be a man, the religion of your forefathers, Abu Talib. And then he died up on that because of the bad company, bad influence. So the first stages of that one, and we mentioned last week, the first, the two migrations before the main migration from Mecca to Medina, the migration to Al-Habasha, to Abyssinia. And when we said, the messenger said, Go to Al-Habasha, go to Abyssinia. There is a king, he does not do injustice to no one. He was a Christian king, he wasn't a Muslim, but the messenger sends those Sahaba there. Because a king who implements justice, who done justice. So who, what, um, so the first migration and the second migration to Abyssinia. So the first migration, why did they return? Who remembers? Why did they return? And then they had to go back, uh, again. They were told that uh, they heard some information from Makkah to become Muslims, to accept Islam. So they came back for that reason. Yeah, so who was leading them in the beginning, the first migration? Uthman radiallahu anhu, yes, Uthman and the daughter of the messenger, his wife Ruqayya. And what about the second one? Who was leading them? Ja'far, Ja'far yes, Ja'far ibn Abi Talib, yes, he was leading them after. And then when we said that the, um, the, the Quraysh, even though now they left Mecca, they're not in Mecca anymore, you know? So they left Mecca, but they sent Amr ibn As and another person with him to bribe al Najashi and the army of Najashi so he can send those Muslims back to you know to, to Mecca but Al-Najashi he was a, a, a king who did justice even though he wasn't a Muslim that time but he was a, a, a king that was just and fair and he was listening to the other side of the story all the time and then he did give refuge to those Muslims in, in his own land regardless of the you know the plotting of, of, of the Quraysh and even as Allah said وَيَمْكُرُونَ وَيَمْكُرُ اللَّهِ وَاللَّهُ خَيْرُ الْمَاكِرِينَ the plots they plan and Allah plans and Allah the best of planners Subhanahu wa ta'ala. Only the plan of Allah that will go, that will work, that will succeed. So those were the incidents that happened before. And now we're going to talk today about the Islam of Hamza and Umar radiallahu anhum wa arda. So towards which year do you think Hamza and Umar became Muslims? 590. So which year after revelation? Twenty years? Forty? Forty years after Revelation? No. Why not? Revelation is only twenty three years. Yes, mashallah, I see. Yeah, it's only twenty three years. Yeah. So it's about year five. Year five after the after revelation. Hamza radiallahu who is Hamza? Yes, so he's the uncle of the Messenger sallallahu alayhi wa so Hamza radiallahu anhu, you can imagine now, subhanallah, when you look at the Islam of Hamza uh, radiallahu anhu and Umar, subhanallah, it's amazing how it happened. And like I said, is the plan of Allah and the guidance is in the hands of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Number one, Hamza radiallahu anhu, he heard one time from certain women in Mecca that Abu Jahl, one time the Messenger sallallahu as we said, even before Abu Jahl used to abuse the Messenger sallallahu and we said, when Fatima radiallahu anha, as a, as a young girl, she witnessed her own father being abused by Abu Jahl, and Abu Jahl was putting dust on the head of the messenger while he was praying in the night by the Kaaba. And he said, if you allow Muhammad, can you imagine, he said, Abu Jahl said, if you allow him to put his face on the dirt again, I will chop his head off. Meaning, his face on the dirt, meaning doing sujood to the Lord of the heavens and the earth, getting closer to his creator, to his Lord. But someone who is ignorant, someone who lives in darkness, he doesn't understand the spiritual connection when you are doing sujood with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So Abu Jahl came and he was abusing the messenger sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. He pushed him in some narration, even he slaps the messenger sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. So some women went to Hamza when they saw him, they said, oh Hamza, because as we said before, tribalism was one of the practices of Jahiliyyah. If someone attacks someone from a tribe, the whole tribe will fight 
uh, the other tribe. The whole tribe would stand up for that person. So then they went to Hamza. They said, oh, Hamza. Oh, the Banu Hashim, because he's from the clan of the Banu Hashim. So the Quraysh is the bigger tribe, the bigger, you know, you could say the bigger village or the bigger city. And there are sub-tribes, you know, the small villages within the same city. So there's the clan of Banu Hashim, Banu Taim, you know, Banu Mahzum. So different tribes, the different clans. So then they said, the women, they said to Hamza, oh, Hamza, shame on you, oh, the Banu Hashim. Your own nephew, Muhammad, وسلم, he's getting abused by Abu Jahl, getting abused by the Quraysh, and you don't defend him, you don't stand up for him, you don't support him. So Hamza, he is the uncle of the messenger, that's his own nephew. So he went to Abu Jahl. Hamza was strong as well. He went to Abu Jahl, he slapped Abu Jahl, he said to him, you know what, you leave my nephew alone. You leave him alone, and then Abu Jahl said, come on, he's coming to take us away from the religion of our forefathers. He's changing our religion. I knew you don't even believe him. He said, no, I believe him. I believe in his religion. I follow his religion. He wasn't. He just said it. He just said it. Just a word that came out of his mouth, of his mouth, of his mouth in a moment of, you know, he was heated up. In a moment of, you know, he was heated up and he wanted to defend his, his nephew. But he doesn't believe. He doesn't worship Allah. He doesn't follow Muhammad. But I just said to Abu Jahl at that moment of time, I believe him. I follow his religion and I believe in him. So Hamza, as he narrates after radiallahu anhu, he said, that was the most difficult night in my life. He spends the whole night, he couldn't even sleep that night. He said, because I already announced to Abu Jahl that I follow the religion of Muhammad, but I didn't. He said, I'm thinking, what have I done? Now Abu Jahl, obviously he would announce it to the Quraysh. So what am I, I going to do? And then he said, I spent the whole night asking Allah to guide me to guide me to make the right decision. He said, that was the most difficult night in my life. And then after, the next morning, he went to the messenger and he said, I announced my shahada, oh Muhammad. Allah guided him. So the lesson here that we take, if someone is lost, pray to Allah. Keep on knocking on the door of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Allah will open the door for you one day. Don't think Allah will never open the door for me. Keep on knocking on the door of Allah. Keep on asking Allah for guidance. Allah will guide you. Don't give up. Allah will guide you. Hamza spends the whole night asking for guidance. What have I done? Oh Allah, guide me to the right decision. And then Allah guided him to make the best decision in his life to become a Muslim. He went and announced to the messenger, peace be upon him. The messenger was so happy, you could not imagine, as in the narrations, the happiness of Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. Number one, that's Hamza, his own uncle, that is his family, that's his own blood, becoming a Muslim. Can you imagine, he's, he's inviting other people to Islam, other people becoming Muslims, Abu Bakr, Uthman, Ali, you know, people, Ali is his cousin, but imagine people who are, who are not related to him becoming Muslims, but his own blood, his own family members not becoming Muslims. It did hurt him a lot, peace be upon him, but now he was so happy that Hamza radiallahu anhu became Muslim. Majority of the narration says only a few days later. A lot of them says three days. Umar will become a Muslim. Can you imagine those first five years, difficulties, hardships? Allah is bringing some ease to your own Muhammad. Allah is bringing some ease to your own Muslims by the Islam of Umar and Hamza because they are two strong people. They, will, they are added value. They are an asset to the believers. They will bring a lot of strength to the Muslims. Allah, bring an ease to you, O Muhammad, and, your, and his followers. So Umar radiallahu anhu, he was the enemy of Allah, we all know. He was the enemy of the messenger in the beginning. He was the enemy of Allah, the enemy of, of the messenger, the enemy of Islam. And then, one time, when they were doing the hijrah to Abyssinia, the second hijrah, he saw one of the women that was doing hijrah, and then he said, are you leaving? She said, yes. He said, may peace and blessings of Allah be upon you and have a safe journey. He's not a Muslim, she's a Muslim. In a way, you could, tell, you could say that Umar felt sorry for her because why? Because of you, because the likes of Umar, because of you, O oh Umar, and people like you, they are doing hijrah to Abyssinia. They are migrating. They are leaving Mecca because they've been abused and tortured because of people like you, O Umar. And then she told her husband, she said, she narrated to him what, what Umar told her. And then she said, he said, she, her husband said to her, she said to him, I think Umar has a soft spot in his heart. 
Her husband said, so what, you, you think that Umar will become a Muslim? She said, yes, I think so. so. She said, I think that he has a soft spot, a soft spot in his heart that he will become a Muslim. The husband said, you're just a woman full of, full of emotions, this, that. He said, Umar will never become a Muslim until the donkey of his father, the donkey of Al-Khattab becomes a Muslim, then Umar will become a Muslim. Meaning in your dreams, this will never happen in this life. This is another lesson that we take with us today. You never judge someone. You can never, ever say that this person will ne never become a Muslim. Someone who is a Muslim, not a good Muslim, you can never, ever say this person will never come back to the path of Allah, will never come back to the straight path. You cannot make that judgment. Only Allah. Only Allah is the only one who knows. No one can say that this person will never become a Muslim. This person will never become a good Muslim. No one can say that. If you do that, that means you are taking the position of Allah. You are claiming to be Allah, that you know the ghaib, you know the unseen. It's only Allah who knows the future. Who knows what ha will happen before, before it happens. Only Allah who knows the unseen. No one else knows, other than Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So that is a big lesson for all of us, because there today, a lot of the Muslims, because of ignorance, they think they know it all, they think, oh, they know, they have some knowledge about Islam, they know everything. No. Oh, this person is this, this person is that, this person is going to Jahannam, this person is going to this place, that place. Who are you? As in the hadith of the Messenger, hadith Qudsi, as Allah said, Man Who is it? Who is it that claims or trying to take my position, trying to be like me, making judgments about people? This is the Lord of the heavens and the earth saying it. Only Allah who knows. Who is going to go to Jahannam? Who's going to go to Hellfire? Who's going to be a good Muslim? Only Allah knows who is pious, who is not pious. Only Allah knows who is sincere, who is not sincere. A person could be saying, preaching about Islam, talking about Islam, but he has no sincerity to Allah. He could be doing it for money, for wealth. He could be doing it to be famous, to become popular. Doing it for social media, you know, million followers, five million followers, subscribers, this, that. Only Allah knows. No one knows. Only Allah that can make that judgment, the judge. Subhanahu wa ta'ala. Only Allah. So it's a big lesson that we learn, brothers and sisters. So then Umar radiallahu anhu, one night, one night, because he used to drink all the time, Umar radiallahu anhu, and he had his companions that he used to drink with every night. One night he went, he couldn't find them. He went to the shop where he used to buy the alcohol from, he, he found it closed. He was looking around, he couldn't find his, you know, his friends that they drink together. The shop is closed. You know, it's closed, he could not buy any, buy any wine that night. He went by the Kaaba, then he saw the messengers, I said, them doing salah. This was night time. And then, subhanAllah, if Allah wants guidance for someone, Allah will facilitate it, Allah will make the means. Then he went, he was thinking, you know what? I have an opportunity now, I could kill him now, no one is watching, I could just get rid of him. He started getting closer to the messenger. The messenger didn't, doesn't even know that he's behind him. No one is there, nobody's watching. As he was getting closer to the messenger, the messenger is doing salah, reciting Quran. And then the messenger, and then Umar was amazed by the ayat that the messenger was reciting. He was amazed, he was like, wow, these words are amazing. He said, this, this is poetry. And then the, the ayat coincides with what Umar was thinking. So Allah, made Muhammad sallam recite the ayat that was specific to what Umar was thinking about. So uh, the messenger gave an answers to what's happening in the mind of Umar, what's going on in his mind at that time. So the messenger will recite ayat relevant to what was going on in the mind of Umar. Poetry, and Allah said, وَمَا هُوَ بِقَوْلِ شَاهِرٍ These are not the words of a poet. Wow, Umar is like, you know, and then Umar think, oh, he's a magician. وَمَا هُوَ بِقَوْلِ شَاهِرٍ What? وَمَا هُوَ بِقَوْلِ كَاهِرٍ Wow, he's not a fortune teller. Umar is thinking, whoa, so what's happening? What, what's, where, so where is it coming from then? And then he says, Tanzeelun min Rabbil Alameen, revelation revealed from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Umar, whoa, he's thinking, he was amazed. He was amazed. He was just listening. He spent a long time listening to the messenger. He never heard such thing in his life. He left. And then, and then one time, according to one of the narrations, some scholars, they do say it is a weak narration, but some scholars, they say it's a strong narration. But the main thing here is we learn the story. He says that Umar radiallahu anhu, one time he wanted to kill the messenger sallallahu alayhi wa because he thought how the Quraysh was becoming divided. You know, the community is not united anymore because of Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa 
She thought, you know what? You thought, you know what? Like the Quraysh were planning to do, if we kill Muhammad Sallam, that's it. We will have that unity, unity that we used to have before. So he was looking for the Messenger Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, and one Sahabi saw him, and he didn't know that Sahabi because at that stage, a lot of the Sahaba they were Muslims, but privately, they never announced their Islam. Only a few Sahaba. So they kept it quiet because they were scared. So that Sahabi that Umar is talking about, he's a Muslim, but Umar doesn't know he's a Muslim. So when you saw him, he saw that Umar has his sword in his hand, and he looks like, you know, he's looking, he's after something. He said, what's wrong with Umar? He said, I'm looking for Muhammad. I want to kill him now. I don't want to put a stop to all this. That's it. So the person was scared about for the messengers. I said, and then he said to him, you know what, oh, Umar, go and sort out your own family. Go and sort your own family because your own family are Muslims. Your own sister, Fatima, is Muslim. He said, what? He went to the wife of his sister, Fatima bin Tul Khattab, and her husband, Saeed ibn Zayd. Saeed ibn Zayd is one of the Sahaba who have been given the glad tidings of, of Jannah. He's one of the Ashar al-Mubashara. So he went, he knocked on the door, and then they saw him. He was Khabbab ibn al-Arat, one Sahabi with them in the house. What used to happen that time? So those Sahaba used to, to meet the messenger in the house of al-Arqam. He used to teach them. And then they used to go to the other Sahaba who couldn't come to the house of Al-Arqam. They used to go and teach them. So the Sahaba, the Rasulullah would teach some of those Sahaba who used to come to the house of Al-Arqam. And then they would go and teach the others. So Khabbab ibn al-Arat, he was teaching the sister of Umar, Fatima, and her husband, Sa'id ibn Zayd, about new revelations that came to the Messenger, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. So when he went inside the house, he told Fatima, عنها, the sister of Umar, he told her, you're a Muslim. You never told me this, that. She said, yes, I am a Muslim. And then, and then he started attacking his brother-in-law, Sa'id ibn Zayd. And then Fatima, she tried to defend her husband. And then he slapped his sister, Fatima, until she was bleeding. When she was bleeding, Umar thought, what am I doing? And then he, he stopped. And then he said, you know what? Show me what he was reading. Show me the script. She said, no, you're not pure. You cannot touch it. So he went, he had a shower, and then... Khabbab ibn al-Arat came out, radiallahu anhu, and then they gave him the script, which is ayahs from the Qur'an, and when he opened it, it was Surah Taha. Taha, ma anzalna alayka al-Qur'an ali tashqa. We have not revealed this Qur'an to you to be distressed, to feel discomfort, to be unhappy, to be sad. We have revealed this Qur'an to you to be happy, to feel peace, tranquility, because you connect in with the Lord of the heavens and the earth. So Umar radiallahu anhu, then the Qur'an did touch the heart of Umar radiallahu anhu. See, so he wanted to become a Muslim. So they took him to the house of Al-Arqam, where the messenger radiallahu alayhi wa sallam was there. So he knocks in the house to, into the house of Al-Arqam. So one Sahabi looked from the door from the inside, and then he was scared because they don't know that Umar is coming to become a Muslim now. So they said to the, he said to the messenger, oh messenger, it's Umar. He got his own sword with him and he is he, outside. So Hamza radiallahu anhu, he said to the messenger, he said, Oh, messenger of Allah, let me deal with him. I'll deal with him. If he's coming for, for goodness, then he's good. If he's coming for anything other than that, I will kill him with his own soul. The messenger said, leave him to me, oh, Hamza. Leave him to me. The messenger was never scared of Umar radiallahu anhu. Even though he was a strong man, Umar. Very strong. To the extent as the Messenger وسلم, narrated that when the shaitan sees Umar, he changes his way, he changes his way. He goes the opposite direction of Umar. Anhu. The shaitan was scared of Umar. Anhu. Umar was strong physically, was strong in his belief in Allah, was strong in his iman. Anhu so the messenger opened the door for Umar and he said, Come on, Umar. And in the narration, he says he grabbed him. The messenger grabbed Umar. The messenger was so strong. The Umar was so stronger than the messenger. But the messenger grabbed him and he, he got him down on his knees. He said, oh, Umar, isn't it about time that you become a Muslim? That you announce your shahada, oh, Umar? And then he said, I came here to announce my shahada, oh, messenger. So he announced the shahada. The whole house of Al-Arqam was doing the takbir. So the people from, from the Kaaba could hear the takbir coming out of the house of Al-Arqam. Umar radiallahu anhu becoming a Muslim, he and now the news to the person who said to his wife that Umar will never become a Muslim until the donkey of Al-Khattab will become a Muslim. Allah made Umar become a Muslim. It's in the hands of Allah, not in the hands of Noah. Guidance is in the hands of Allah. 
Jannah is in the hands of Allah. Allah did not choose no one to be the security guard of the Jannah. So that we start keeping judgment now. You go into Jannah, you go into Halfa, you're going to be the lowest place of Jannah, you go into the highest place of Jannah now. Only Allah, subhanahu wa ta'ala, brothers and sisters. So Umar became a Muslim. Can you imagine someone who was an enemy of the Messenger, the enemy of Allah, the enemy of the religion, becoming a Muslim? <coughs> so what lessons do we take from that before we carry on, brothers and sisters? Imagine Umar, how he was before, now he became a Muslim. What lessons do you take with you? What lessons do you take from this? Yeah? Any more? You know, in our, our days, when we see somebody doing wrong, like, you know, we see a, a foreign president uh, send, sending army towards our Muslims, rather than praying for their desire, we, <clears throat> or we automatically say, no, I'll send it to Jahannam, or do this, do that. We shouldn't, we shouldn't pray bad on anybody, because we don't know how far we are ourselves, you know? We should always ask for desire for everybody. Yes, yes. We we'll ask guidance for everybody. Any more? Any more brothers? Any more? Okay. So yeah, as the brother mentioned, mashallah, so we ask for guidance for everyone. And that's you know the incidents as we mentioned last Jummah, as we will talk about after here again, is the incidence of Taif. They were, throwing, they were throwing stones at the messenger, peace be upon him. And yet, he did not want them to be punished. He did not want the angel to demolish the two mountains in them. Why? Because he was mercy to mankind and he wanted them to taste the beauty and the sweetness of Iman, of connecting with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So yeah, so you ask guidance for every human being, every person. And the messenger, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, he used to make dua to Allah. So, oh Allah, Oh Allah, grant oh Allah make the Muslims stronger and give strength to Islam by the Islam of one of the two Umars. He was always making dua that one of the two Umars will become a Muslim. But he said, Sallallahu Alaihi he said in the narration, he said that I always knew that Umar ibn Khattab will be the better option for the Muslims. So Umar became a Muslim, radiallahu anhu. When he became a Muslim, he said to the Messenger وسلم, for the first time ever that the Muslims could, could go and do tawaf around the Kaaba publicly. Umar said to the Messenger وسلم, he said, Oh Messenger of Allah, are we not on the straight path? He said, Yes. Is this not a true religion? He said, Yes. He said, So why are we scared, O Messenger of Allah? Let's go and publicize our Islam, announce our Islam publicly. Why should we be scared? So for the first time ever, Hamza radiallahu anhu leading one group and Umar leading the other and they marched down towards the Kaaba for the first time they could, they could, they could do tawaf publicly around the Kaaba. So you could, you could imagine how much, how much strength Hamza and Umar radiallahu anhu brought to the Muslims to the religion of Allah radiallahu anhu. So Allah brought ease to the Muslims by the Islam of Hamza and Umar. Umar radiallahu anhu he found out that his own son, Abdullah, was a Muslim. But he never told him, because he was scared of him. So Umar al -Anhu, he was beating up his own son at that moment of time, because he said to him that I was going to die as a disbeliever. I could go to hellfire. Why didn't you guide me? Why didn't you tell me? Uh, Abdullah ibn Umar was scared. He said, I was scared of my father. If you find out that I was a Muslim, I was scared. They're going to torture me. You're going to abuse me. You're going to kill me. That's why. But look at how Umar was thinking at that moment of time. He was thinking, he's not thinking, why didn't you tell me just for the sake of it? No. He said, I could have died as a non-Muslim. You know, you could have saved me. Oh, my son, I'm your father. You could have saved, saved me. That's why he was worried about it. He was sad because he didn't tell him about it because he could have died as a non-Muslim. Radiallahu anhu. Who knows what's the nickname of Umar? Yes, Al Farooq. Al Farooq meaning the distinguisher between the right and the wrong. Al Farooq. Radiallahu anhu arda. Al Farooq. Here we come back to the, when we mentioned earlier, idol worshipping and it doesn't make sense and, you know, logically speaking, it's something that does not make sense at all. Umar was an idol worshipper, radiallahu anhu, before. But as we said before, can you imagine, brothers, yeah? Can you imagine seeing that this is Umar before Islam? But now, every time you speak about Umar, how do you mention him? Yeah, as a Muslim, you say, Radiallahu anhu. May Allah be pleased with you. See how Allah changes people? Someone could be the worst 
of mankind, the worst human being out there, Allah can change them. And that's one thing that we should never give up on people. If you have, a, you know, your son, your daughter, your brother, your sister, a family member, a friend, someone, you never give up on people. Don't say, oh, you know what? It's Ten years we've been calling, we've been telling them to, to come back to the straight path. There's that. That's it. Never. Ah. Never give up no one. Never give up on no one. Allah can change someone within a blink of an eye. Allah can change them completely. Allah can bring them from darkness into the light. In one second. You know? So that is something that we have to think about, brothers and sisters. So don't give up on no one. You have someone that you know, someone, you know, don't give up on them. So Umar radiallahu anhu, he was an idol worshipper. Can you imagine someone who should drink, do adultery, all sorts of bad things. Bad things. He was a bad person before. Subhanallah. But then, after, long time after, the messengers used to sit with the companions and used to speak to them about their jahiliyyah time about their jahiliya practices. And they used to laugh about it that time after. Imagine, they used, in, they used to be in jahiliya doing bad stuff, but now, now they became Muslims, Allah guided them, they live under the shade of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, and now they just laugh about those moments of jahiliya. So then, the Messenger sallam, he asked Umar, and this is a lesson to reflect and ponder upon. He asked Umar, he said, Oh Umar, didn't you have a brain, O oh, Umar, at that time? Meaning, Umar, anhu, some idols used to be made with stones and mud and everything, and used to be bought, sold, and everything. Some of them, like Umar, he used to make his own god, his own idol with dough. And when he gets hungry, he eats it. And then he will make another one. And then he will worship it. And then he gets hungry, he eats it. And then you make another one. So the messenger said, didn't you have a brain? Oh, Umar, come on, it doesn't make sense. Now you ask someone who is five, year, five years old, he will think, come on, this is, this is, you know, this is silly. You know, it doesn't make no sense. You, don't, you know, you do not need to be a Muslim, you know, to think this is, you know, this doesn't make sense. You bring any human being, who, you know, someone who's an atheist, someone who doesn't believe, he would say, come on, this doesn't make sense. But can you imagine now someone, but subhanAllah, can you just imagine that? He makes his own God with dough. He worships it, he bows down to it, he makes dua to it, he asks it to give him this, provide for him, whatever, and then he eats it. And then he makes a new one. And then, subhanAllah, and then the messenger asks him, he said, didn't you have a brain? No, Omar, didn't you have a mind? Allah has given you a mind, a brain. And then he said, he said, oh, messenger of Allah, it's not that I didn't have a brain at that time. It's not that I didn't have a mind at that time, O oh Messenger of Allah. I had a brain. I had a mind at that time, O oh Messenger of Allah. But I didn't have guidance. There was no guidance. Guidance, what matters? Every person has a mind. There are so many intellectuals out there, but they bow down to the cow, to the moon, to the stars, to the sun. You know, they don't believe in the existence of Allah. So they have an intellect, they have a mind, but there's no guidance. <laughs> There is no guidance. When you are preventing yourself from guidance, because Umar radiallahu anhu, Allah was preparing him. Because when he was listening to the messenger at that time, even though he wasn't a Muslim, he was listening to him, that was preparation for Umar. You know? So that he can become a Muslim. So people, they block themselves from the guidance. It's not Allah prevents them from guidance, but they block themselves and they prevent themselves from guidance. That's why. So guidance is very important. That's why Allah said, وَإِنَّكَ لَا تَهْدِي مَنْ أَحْبَبْتِ You do not guide whom you love, O Muhammad. Allah guides whom He wants. Guidance is in the hand of Allah. Because if guidance was in the hands of the Messenger, He could have guided Abu Talib to start with. He could have guided Abu Lahab, his own family members. He could have guided them first. But guidance is not in the hand of no one. Guidance is in the hands of Allah. So the, the final lesson that we take with us today, if we are guided, we shouldn't think that it's because of us. Oh, I'm a good Muslim. I'm a good person. That's why, I, you know, I go to the masjid. I do salah. I do jumu'ah. I do this. I do that. No. It's guidance. So we should be grateful to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala that he has guided us to be Muslims, to be good Muslims, to do salah, to do, you know, to come to jumu'ah, to give charity, to go to hajj, to fast in Ramadan. We have to refer 
or link the guidance, refer it to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, not to us. It's not because of us, it's because of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So these are the stories of some of the Sahaba, and this is Umar and Hamza radiallahu anhum. You could see the, the Muslims became so strong by the Islam of Hamza and Umar radiallahu anhum. Umar was the enemy of Allah, but he became one of the best human beings who lived on this earth. So after the messengers and the prophets of Allah, Abu Bakr is the first human being, the best human being, and then after him comes Umar. After him comes Umar. Can you imagine? Islam transformed the life of Umar completely. This is just one person we're talking about, but you will see the Sahaba after. This is what I'm saying. Reflect and ponder all the time how Islam changed them completely, how Islam transformed the lives of those who used to live in Jahiliya. It, you know, they became the best nation, the best human beings who lived on this earth because of this religion that we follow today, because of this Quran that we have today, because of this messenger that we follow today, brothers and sisters. This is the beauty of Islam. Beauty of Islam, it changes people, it makes them better people. It makes them people of goodness, those who do goodness on earth. It makes them become people of purity, those who are pure, people of sincerity, people of love. They loved one another. Umar, after from the enemy to someone who loves Allah, who loves the messenger, who loves the religion, who loves his Muslim brothers and sisters, who loves humanity. So this is Islam. So Islam is not just, you know, physical activities and this and that. No, Islam has to be from the inside. It's that spiritual connection that purifies you from the inside that makes you a better person. That's why Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala said, the day we meaning the day of judgment the day in which no one will benefit from his wealth from his family from the titles that he used to he used to have in dunya but from the pure heart that he used to have in dunya pure heart is important how you purify your heart by connecting with allah by doing salah the more you do salah the proper salah that allah has asked asks us to do, you become a person who is pure. You purify yourself. You strive all the time because of that connection. It makes you a better person. So you become a person who is pure from the inside. When you become a person who is pure from the inside, you do goodness on earth. Your manners will, will be good. You'll have good manners, good characteristics. You love your Muslim brothers and sisters. You love humanity. You conduct yourself in a way that shows the true teachings of Islam. That's why the Messenger وسلم, he had a neighbor who was a Jewish person. I'm sure that a lot of you heard this before. He was a Jewish person who used to put rubbish on the doorstep of the Messenger every day. Every day. And then one day he didn't. One day he didn't. The Messenger went to visit him. He was, he was sick. The, the day he didn't, he went to visit him. He said, something is wrong with him. I have to go and visit him. Can you imagine this? Who would do this? No one. But Muhammad sallam. That's why Allah said, Wa inna ka ala khuluqin adil. That's why Allah in the Quran, He praised him. He said, You have the best of manners, the best of characteristics, O Muhammad. So then the man, the man became Muslim. See, this is Islam. Islam has to be in our manners, our characteristics. This is Islam. Islam is not just, you know, reading books, lectures, doing salah. No, Islam is about actions, our behavior how we conduct ourselves, and we learn it from the messenger, how you conduct yourself with your family, with your Muslim brothers, sisters, with non-Muslims, with your neighbors, with your colleagues. You learn from Muhammad Sallallahu how to become a good person. As we said before, to finalize today, we mentioned this before, but just as a reminder, this is Islam, just for us to take lessons. This is Islam, but we take lessons, and I'm hoping that you go away and you reflect and ponder upon these lessons. As we said, Ibrahim alayhi salam. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, he made a house. Okay, so metaphorically speaking, Allah made a house. Okay, Allah made a house and he called it the house of Islam. Darul Islam. Meaning the religion of Islam. The religion of Islam is the house of Islam. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, he invited all his creation to his house. Like I said, imagine now someone is inviting another person, you invite someone and you put a gun here and you say, you know what, come for dinner to my, to, my, to, to my house tonight. Come for dinner to my house tonight. 
You are forcing them to come because you're putting a gun here and you're forcing them. You're saying, come for dinner to my house tonight. You're forcing them. This is not an invitation. An invitation is only when you allow the person to, to refuse the invitation. You give them the choice. So Allah, he made the house. He called it Darul Islam, the house of Islam, the religion of Islam. And he invited all his creation to his house. He invited all his creation to his house. And he has given them the choice to come his, to his house or not to come to his house. He give, he's given them the choice to follow his religion or not to follow his religion. He has given them the choice. Allah did not force no one. Allah has given us a choice to come to his house, to his religion. So Ibrahim alayhi salam, one time, he was having dinner and he invited someone. In some narrations, he says, Ibrahim alayhi salam, he never used to have dinner on his own. He was so kind and so generous, peace be upon him. So he invited the man to his house to have dinner with him. And the man, when he, was start, when he, start, when he wanted to start eating, he praised the food by the name of his, of his God, the idol that he used to worship. So Ibrahim was so annoyed and so angry and so upset because he said you should praise in the name of Allah. So he kicked out the man. He said, go, don't eat my food. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, can you imagine? Allah revealed to Ibrahim alayhi salam. He said, oh, Ibrahim, this person for 40 years, 40 years, he's an idol worshiper. He's associating partners with me for 40 years. He doesn't worship me for 40 years, oh, Ibrahim. And I've been providing for him, oh Ibrahim. Can you imagine? 40 years, he's an idol worshiper. He doesn't believe in Allah. He doesn't worship Allah. And Allah provides for him. Never stops providing for him, even once. And then Allah said to Ibrahim, oh Ibrahim, you couldn't be patient with him, even for one meal, oh Ibrahim. And then Ibrahim went out looking for the man. He brought him back to his house. And the man was shocked. He said, why did you call me back? He told him what Allah has revealed to him. And the man became a Muslim. SubhanAllah. This is the religion of Allah. This is the mercy of Allah, brothers and sisters. How Allah, just think about it. How Allah is patient with us. How many sins do we do? How many sins do we commit? How many sins do we go, oh, you know, Allah, I'll never do this. Oh, Allah, I promise if Allah, you know, forgives me this time. If Allah, you know, brings ease to me, I have some problems in life. Oh, Allah, you know what? If this problems, you know, if this problem is solved, I'd be a good person, good Muslim. I pray this, that. Once Allah brings ease to you, you forget those promises. You forget, you know, those you know, ideas that you had before. This is the mercy of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. This is Islam. So I'm hoping that we take lessons with us from, you know, the seerah of Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. It's not a sequence of events, but it's a resource. It's lessons. It's principles that we need to take with us in order for us, in order for us to implement them in our lives, brothers and sisters. Subhanakallahumma bihamdika. Ashadu an la ilaha illa anta nasakhfiruka wa natubu ilayk. Salli lama wa sallim wa barik ala nabiyina Muhammadin wa ala alihi wa sahabihi ajma'in.